Whoo, everybody, woosa. <laughs> Um, I had to do a very quick pivot from the train to driving down here, so I apologize if I'm driving, I'm speaking like I drive. Uh, but, and I did fly low to get here in time, but thank you for your patience. I'm very excited to talk about some new developments um, in the description of mast cell activation disease and, and new therapies that I think might be uh, really helpful for a lot of us who are sitting in this room. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. And let's just talk about the rise of hypersensitivity disorders. There's been a huge change in the burden of disease uh, within the past century. And I, often when patients come to see me, I, I, you know, especially the parents have a tendency to focus on their children, and I just tell them, well, what was the world like when you grew up? And then what was the world like when your parents grew up? And then, and literally what we're seeing is the fact that we have so transformed our environment, our bodies just have not, accust have not grown accustomed to um, uh, to the exposures that we're now seeing on a daily basis. And so as an allergy immunology specialist, we have a tendency to keep testing. Um, so if you are having nasal congestion, gastrointestinal upset, even the diagnosis of bladder pain syndrome or interstitial cystitis will allergy test you, but we're really treating the, um, we're really treating the immune system as though it's a one-trick pony. And I would say about almost 15 years ago, we were seeing patients uh, that were having hypersensitivity reactions and allergy testing wasn't explaining it, but last time I checked, the cell that is in, found in frogs, uh, shellfish, uh, dogs, and actually dogs and cats are having as much problems with our environment as we are. Um, we have to kind of look at the fact that these cells is responsible for protecting us if anything gets past our borders. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna just briefly talk about the fact that our borders are potentially responsible or at the core of why we're seeing so much rise in hypersensitivity disorders. And if you have a connective tissue disorder, you might be the canary in the coal mine on all the changes that have happened in our environment. Talk a little bit about uh, interactome dysregulation. And then uh, I'll talk about some therapies that might be helpful. So when I uh, left medical school and entered residency training, basically that was the time that they finally identified the job of mast cells uh, showing that they have have um, uh, the one receptor that was responsible for anaphylaxis and allergen-driven mass activation disease. Um, and so basically, since 1989, most allergists, if you come to their office with symptoms worrisome of not tolerating whatever you're breathing, putting on your skin, or ingesting, we would just allergy test you. And so, hence the allergist was, you know, get the story, test, you want shots, and then repeat. Um, so, but in 2024, I would say we're now at the point of recognizing there are a lot more receptors on the mast cells besides the quote unquote allergy receptor. There are estrogen and progesterone receptors. There are receptors that recognize pain medications such as morphine. Um, there are uh, the ability for mast cells to talk to other cells such as T cells and B cells. Um, they have toll-like receptors that can recognize viruses like uh, SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID. So we really need to appreciate that this cell is well equipped to deal with the environment that was existence a, a century ago and really is quite confused about the exposures now. So in around 2010, there was a growing number of allergy immunology specialists, hematologists, oncologists where they were seeing individuals having hypersensitivity reactions and allergy testing in a much more rare form of mast cell disease called systemic mastocytosis did not explain why these mast cells were inappropriately releasing these mediators. So they came up with a pro proposed criteria to say, is this person having a mast cell problem? Twitchy mast cells, misbehaving mast cells, you know, mast cells that need to you know, go on vacation. So, so it, it's really quite simple. You know, do you have signs or symptoms impacting you in any one of these organ systems? And I have to say the most common manifestations that bring people to our office is either skin or gastrointestinal tract. But understand mast cells are in every part of your body. So it's really important to uh, consider that mast cell misbehaving can cause neuropsychiatric symptoms, can cause bladder problems, um, and also can cause um, gastrointestinal distress. So this is the formal uh, protocols. It's like, do you have these signs or symptoms? Do you get better with medications that target the mast cells or the, the chemical mediators such as histamine or leukotrienes? And then after you get a good story, 
what's the data? Okay, and I think it's really hard for us practitioners who have, what, three minutes to listen to your story and seven minutes to come up with a plan and move on to the next patient, whether you're in an academic center or in a private practice, we don't have enough uh, sub uh, objective data to support all the different ways mast cells misbehave. So if you have an elevated tryptase that's helpful, and by the way, we measure tryptase like cardiologists measure uh, cardiac enzymes, you need to get serial measurements to see whether or not your mast cells are a little bit more twitchy. There's the prostaglandin metabolites and histamine metabolites, but uh, just to let you know, they're also made by basophils and neutrophils. So really the question is, are you having a hypersensitivity issue? And if so, what might be the cells that are behind it, and then what are driving those cells to misbehave? Once you get the diagnosis of, of mast cell activation disease, and that's because, again, tryptase does, isn't released on all uh, hypersensitivity reactions, you want to then figure out why your mast cells are misbehaving. So the more rare form is individuals that have that clonal mast cell disease called systemic mast cell cytosis. Um, and then we have systemic mast cell cytosis junior, um, and then you have, uh, which actually is actually quite common in the Caucasian population, there's a genetic mutation called HAT, or hyperalpha tryptosemia. Um, and interestingly enough, this was an observation in 2016, and in that cohort of patients, those individuals were found to have mast cell activation disease, dysautonomia, and evidence of uh, uh, signs and symptoms worrisome for hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or hypermobile spectrum disorder. That's the minority. The majority is the mast cells are trying to, do, trying to help out. Just like your muscles are trying to help out with your loose ligaments, mast cells are trying to help out because you might be missing something that is uh, supposed to be protecting you against the incoming. And there's a lot of incoming. You have to think uh, 50 years ago or even 30 years ago, the average American spent maybe 60% of their time indoors. Now the average American spends 90 to 93% of their time. You have to trust the ventilation system, the carpeting, uh, the food preparation, that it's not off-gassing or has uh, elements that might be attacking your borders, raising that silent alarm, and then telling the mast cells and the nerves to increase their activity. So this leads me to, if you, if you have the diagnosis of MCAS-ish, you can quote me on that. Um, that basically says you have signs and symptoms, you get better, with, you get better, you get some relief with some of these medications, but the data doesn't support it. But it's still really important to make sure that you're not missing the diagnosis of another condition that could look or masquerade or mimic mast cell activation syndrome. And in this case, I would definitely lend into individuals that have uh, connective tissue issues, as well as individuals that have um, uh, uh, autonomic dysfunction. So I'm gonna zip along, and this is just to give you a story of a, of a little boy that I had seen who kind of opened my eyes on how I was mistrained at Yale, University of Pennsylvania, Harvard, and Mount Sinai. So, 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 so just wanna, so very quickly, this boy had seen 10 other allergists before I met him, and he also saw at least another 30 physicians, and he was hiving anaphylaxis, asthma, neurocognitive impairment. And I actually just had time to have a story with him, and basically uh, asked him, asked the mother, was he always like this? And, and she said, yes, he was. And then the pediatrician who was caring for him said, you know what, I don't know what you got, which is a lot, what a lot of practitioners need to say, um, but I want you to just simplify the world that he's taking in. I want you to breastfeed, I want you to minimize your diet, but don't compromise your nutrition. I want you to stick to cotton and minimize any chemicals that are in the home. And the boy did well for a year. And then the pediatrician retired, the new pediatrician came on board, asked him why he can't eat milk, drink milk, and all the symptoms came back within 24 to 36 hours. And then he went through testing for the next year and a half until the husband's like, this is ridiculous, I don't, you know, the, the doctors don't know what they're doing which was true, because I was one of them. Um, and so, so we need to kind of you know, invest. And so basically, she found out that I trained at one of the three programs that focused on mast cell diseases. And here's the thing, there's only one allergy immunology specialist for 100,000 residents in this country. And he got tested and tested and tested, and guess what? They said MCAS-ish. So you can imagine, he saw a lot of different doctors, and only person who said not allergy was the, uh, was the allergy specialist. So again, here are your questions. Uh, this is the workup that I do. Um, and it turns out the only thing that came up with Sean 
was the fact that he had hypermobility, his mother had hypermobility, his brother had my hypermobility, the cousin had hypermobility. Okay, hypermobile. And of course, that was like one question on my boards 10 years prior. So what we need to do is try to figure out this, this, this activity of our borders dealing with the environment and the fact that our nerves and our mast cells are acting as first line responders. They do surveillance, they decide what they need to, um, how they can respond to the danger, and then they also help coordinate repair after the insult is contained. Uh, so I just wanted to take away mast cells and more than allergy. And let's t and just to give you an idea that these are all the different chemicals that they release and all the different cells that they talk to. Uh, just wanted to point out that uh, uh, the mast cell disease issue has been found to be associated dating back to the 1970s. And then I did several, this is uh, work by Paolo Abiola at University of Cincinnati, which is an epicenter for East Symphilic Gastrointestinal Disease, who also showed that if you have a connective tissue disease, you're at increased risk for having mast cell disease and eosinophilic disease. Um, and welcome to the veterinary world. So I do go use Google and I found Dr. Symes and who basically said, do you ever wonder any special species or breeds that are more susceptible to having mast cell disease? Um, so let's fast forward a little bit to talking about what happens. And this is just showing you, there's been a lot of uh, practitioners and scientists showing that there seems to be immune dysregulation and nerve dysregulation. And I'm gonna zip over to, because I have three minutes. This is the border. You know, 50 years and prior, we were dealing with infectious agents. Since then, we're dealing with a lot of exposures, both physical triggers and chemical triggers uh, that are stripping our borders and exposing our first responders to the environment, which is activating them inappropriately. And, uh, and, and, and I, I can't even tell you, we're all worried about tobacco. That's nothing like the food industry. So we, we really are having exposures that are stripping our skin, gastrointestinal tract, uh, respiratory tract, and the urogenital tract as well. Um, and just the base of it might be recurrent uh, stripping and injury to the borders that now activates that neuroimmune network. And then the neuroimmune network, if it keeps on happening, eventually will start calling in T cells and B cells and also causing remodeling in the, in the neuronal network as well. So just to give a quick story, this is Sarah who actually had a triptase of 11.4 back in 2012. It was high normal. I'm not one to write out something that is at the low normal or, or high normal. Um, and the alpha tryptosemia uh, was, story wasn't known. But interestingly enough, uh, she had was fine except for migraines, uh, proprioceptive issues, hypersensorality, and some growing pains. Um, you can imagine she got an infection, then all of a sudden she had intractable uh, gastrointestinal distress. She went through uh, several major pediatric hospitals on the East Coast, including one hospital that physically restrained her um, and force fed her for four days. Um, when they finally let her go because she didn't get any better, um, she came back to me. Uh, I ended up seeing that she was hypermobile, referred her to Dr. Petra Klinger, found out she had a cult tethered cord. The occult tether cord repair, her nausea went away two to three days later. So it's really important, if you have these signs or symptoms, it's important to be assessed for whether or not you have uh, um, immune dysfunction, including mast cells that misbehave because there are other problems with your immune system, as well as whether or not you have neurological dysregulation as well. I, and this is, I just wanted to point out the importance of the crosstalk between the vagus, the adrenergic system, and the mast cell compartment. If you end up having cervical spine instability or a cult tethered cord, you're gonna cause an imbalance in the vagus and the adrenergic system. You'll actually cause increased inflammation to happen, and this might be happening in individuals that have these musculoskeletal issues that then lead to autonomic dysregulation. So, um, and I think, if we talk about, let's move along. This, I think, is my old talk. It is my old talk. Um, I'm just going to talk very quickly about what I think might be going on in individuals that have endometriosis as well as um, uh, interstitial cystitis. 
um, you're having irritation of chemicals that you are eliminating, and that in turn is stripping the, the border of the bladder wall. That's gonna cause activation of both the nerves and the mast cells. And as long as that keeps on happening, or for instance, if you have an issue with urinary retention and that stuff sits there, that also is gonna injure the barrier. And by injuring the barrier, you will call in your first responders, which are the nerves and the mast cells as well. So, the take home message here really is if you have food intolerances, if you have uh, pelvic pain and bladder pain, and urinary retention, if you have diarrhea alternating with constipation, you need to be fully evaluated for whether you have a deviation in that neuroimmune access that is causing you to have this chronic neuroinflammatory issues impacting the lining of your gastrointestinal tract from your nose and mouth down to your tush, as well as your uh, urinary tract system as well. Uh, this is my contact information. I apologize for running through, but I, I just wanted to kind of wet your whistle on, on the fact that we need to think about how our bodies are navigating our current environment. Thank you.